you have been on uh, our website, if you have been on Facebook, if you have been on Instagram, or any of those platforms over the last week or so, you know we had some, we made an announcement about some big and exciting news that we want to share with you. In fact, some of you have come out especially today because of the announcement. Thank you, Miss Cindy. So I love her, so I had to brag on her and just mess with her. But some of you, again, saw that announcement, and you said, what is, what is this big news? In fact, as I was coming in today, some of the, some of the ushers were like, all right, pastor, do we have a, a clearance? Do we have a clearance to get the news ahead of time? Like, no, you got to wait to the end. And so guess what? We all going to have to wait to the end <laughs> to get the big news. But everything that we're going to talk about today coincides with the big news. In fact, God is just so amazing. Me and Pastor Sean was talking a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about this series, and, you know, we were talking about the big news that was coming up, and so Pastor Sean asked me, say, well, you know, does the message that she prepared for that day, does that coincide with the message, you know, with the big news? Are you going to have to, you know, do something different? It was like, I don't know yet. I have to go look at the title and stuff. I already got that planned out, but I don't know. And when I opened it up and I looked at it, I was like, go ahead, God. It was a perfect fit. He had already planned the whole thing out. But I'd like to uh, start our time today by quoting to you the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus said this. Jesus said that there is no greater love than a man has than this. Then he laid down his life for a friend. And that's what we're going to be talking about in today's study. That's what we're going to be talking about all day long. This is part three of this teaching series that we began a few weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, we started off this teaching series entitled Engage, which is all about engaging God. And we talked about how that the first and the most important way that all of us are to engage God is by making right choices, is by making right decisions. And we talked about that the main choice, that the main decision that we need to make is, what are we going to do about Jesus? What are we going to do with Jesus? And we talked about how that when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, man, we're now on the right road. So the Bible talks about how there are two roads. There's this broad, wide road that leads to destruction. And there's many people on it. Many people find it. But then there's this narrow road that leads to life. And few find it. But those of us who receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we are on that narrow road. And so, again, the first and the most important decision that we have to make is, what are we going to do with Jesus? Now, after that, we talked about how that when we receive Jesus Christ, that we need to follow what he says. We actually talked about how that there is a blessing in obedience, a blessing in obedience. And we talked about how that when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, man, that God has all of these, all of these blessings that he wants to give unto us. Blessings. Again, God says, I want to pour you out blessings. You don't even have room enough to receive. You like that, don't you? I know I do. Many times I say, go for it, God. Go for it. Go for it. Pour out the blessings. But here's the thing about God's blessings. God's blessings that he gives to us, his people, his sons, his daughters, his children, nobody can take them away. Nobody can take them from us, but we can forfeit our blessings. We can forfeit the blessings that God has ordained for us. And how? Through disobedience. In today's study, again, we're going to be talking about again, hmm, loving our neighbor. Loving our neighbor. So again, with these things in mind, let's go ahead and begin reading. Let's begin reading right there in the book of John. John chapter 11, starting right there in verse 1. And it reads, now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. 
It was Mary who anointed Jesus with ornament and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was, which is odd. Verse 7. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After hearing these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now, Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. A lot of faith. Verse 17, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the, day, in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And anyone who lives and lives believes in me, shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went to call her sister, Martha, saying in private, the teacher is here. He is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Martha rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Martha came, when Mary rather came to Jesus and saw her, saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, can not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, but this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, 
I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Stop right there, if you will. Jesus said, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. Question, how many of you believe that? How many of you believe that if you really believe in the words of Jesus, in the words of our Lord, in the words of our God, in the words of Christ, that you will see the glory of God? Do you believe that? Well, I want you to know it is true. If you believe, if we believe, we will see the glory of God manifested amongst us. Now, there are a lot of things that we could talk about in this passage of Scripture. But what I want to concentrate on today is what Jesus says in the very end of what we read today, which is to unbind him and to let him go. If you have your Bibles, please circle that, highlight that, underline those words, unbind him and let him go. And see, the reason why I want to highlight that, the reason why I want to concentrate on that is this, because in that statement that Jesus made, what you have is the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man when it comes to kingdom building. Are you hearing me? If you're listening, say amen. Amen. In that statement that Jesus made, in the fact that Jesus says, unbind him and let him go, in that what you have is the sovereignty of God, but also the responsibility of man when it comes to kingdom building. See, first of all, understand and know this. God is sovereign when it comes to giving life. He is the author and the finisher of life. He is the author and the sustainer of life. He is the one who spoke and the heavens and the earth came into being. He is the one who reached down into the ground and took some dirt and fashioned into a man and breathed into him. And man became a life giving spirit. God is sovereign when it comes to life. But also understand this. God is the one who tells us and numbers the length of our days. Write this scripture down. Please never forget this. Write this down. Psalms 139. In Psalms 139, verse 16, the psalmist says this. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So God knows how long each and every one of us is going to live. See, sometimes we think that the length of our days is a lot of times controlled by us. We think, well, if I do this or if I don't do that, that's going to make my life longer. No, it's not going to make your life longer. It might make your life better. See, we all know there's been some people, right, I mean, who followed the strict diets and they did all kind of exercise and they did all of those things and they died at a young and early age. Amen. But then we also know there's some older people, man, who just lived a horrible life and they lived a long time. I don't know about you, but it's funny that sometimes, you know, on television, they talk about it and they might interview a person, you know, who's 90 years or 95 years old or maybe even 100 years old. And they say, hey, well, what is the the secret of the longevity of your life? And they go, whiskey. Whiskey. I drink whiskey every day. It keeps the blood flowing. It, lu- it lubricates me. And you're going, whiskey. So again, there is no rhyme or reason. A reason rather. Again, when we exercise, when we take vitamins, when we eat good, that might make again our lives better. Right? Because now we're able to get around better. We're able to do things, but it does not make our lives longer. Our lives, the days of our lives are in the hands of God. 
He is the one who is sovereign when it comes to giving life, and he is also the sustainer of life. That also means that he's the giver of physical life as well as spiritual life. And so, in this passage of Scripture that we're looking at here today, because God is doing some uh, kingdom business, he gives life to Lazarus. I don't know if you realize or not, but when God gave life to Lazarus, when God called Lazarus forth, not only did he give him physical life, he reconformed or he can reconfigure his body. And how do I know that? Because he's been in the tomb for four days. By four days being dead, the body starts to decompose. Amen? That's why his sister says, by now, Lord, there's a bad odor. Now, for those of you who have a King James Bible, which says, by now he stinketh. Which means that he is decomposing. So not only did the Lord give him life again, the Lord actually fixed his body while he was doing the same thing, while he was doing those things. And so again, because God is, is sovereign, he gave Lazarus life but also notice what we're talking about again. Notice the responsibility of man. He in the kingdom building process, he told his disciples, I've given him life. Now you go and unbind him. Now you go and set him free. See, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. You must be born again. Some of you know the passage of scripture where this, this man, this leader in Israel, a guy by the name of Nicodemus, he went to Jesus at night and he asked Jesus this question. We really had this question upon his heart. And you find this in the book of John. In John chapter 3 and verse 1, Nicodemus went to Jesus wondering, how is it that a person enters into the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, a lot of people say, well, what do you mean born again? Even Nicodemus said, well, how is it? How can a man go back into his mother's womb? And Jesus says, no, no. The flesh gives birth to the flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You must be born again of God's spirit. And so, again, it's through the spirit that a person is born again, and that is the sovereign work of God. Only God can do that. But again, God gives man a responsibility that when he does a new work, when he brings forth new right, I mean, new life, he gives man, he gives us, the disciples, the awesome privilege of working with him in setting those people free. Do you understand something? Just because a person is born again, it does not mean that they do not have struggles and issues. Amen? I hope you know that. I hope you understand that. Because a lot of people don't. A lot of people think that once they're born again, that all of their troubles, all of their issues, all of their struggles are going to disappear. The Bible says I'm a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. Whole thing passed away. Behold, all things are new. And so now all I got to do is ease on down the yellow brick road. It's going to be easy. You have a lot of people who think that once they're born again, that they have no more struggles. They don't have to deal with, you know, the struggles of drugs or alcohol or relationship or finances or anger. And it's sad. It's really sad that you could actually go in some churches and they would actually encourage that. Well, see, all you have to do is come to the altar. We're going to anoint you with oil. All right? And we're going to get rid of that, that angry spirit. You're going to come to the altar and we're going to get rid of you know, this spirit or that spirit. Oh, pastor, elders, can you help me? You know, I, 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 I got a problem with my weight. Pastor, can you cast out this weight demon? <laughs> While you sit there and watch 25 episodes of the cooking channel. 
No. Just because you are born again of God's spirit, it does not mean that you don't have issues. It does not mean that you don't have struggles. But that's what we, the body of Christ, that's what we, the disciples of God, has been given the awesome privilege, the awesome responsibility of helping people to walk in the victory that Jesus won on the cross. See, because all of us, all of us, everybody who has received Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior is on the journey, right? Some of us been walking with the Lord, you know, 30, 40 years. Some are just beginning. But guess what? Everybody goes through the same struggles. And so what the Lord does is the Lord will ask, have us walk through something and then later on have somebody else come to us who's walking through that same thing, feeling like they're the devil incarnate because they can't break that thing. And then you go, let me holler at you. Man, I struggle with that. I struggle with that. It's amazing how that, especially when you have uh, new couples and they get together and they get married. And, you know, after the marriage, after the honeymoon, I mean, after the honeymoon, the real marriage begins. You know that, right? (laughs) That that honeymoon, short, short, short. After the honeymoon, you got to start dealing with stinky feet, <laughs> bad breath, why you leave your clothes in the middle of the floor, I don't have nothing to eat, I don't have no clean clothes. Man, maybe think of the man, I don't know where this is coming from, but God, here it is. Maybe think of the man that uh, saw, this, uh, saw this woman, she was a singer. And man, could he sing? Could the woman sing? And so uh, the man said, with a voice like that, I got to marry her. I'm going to marry her. And the guys kept telling him, man, you just met her a couple of days ago. Don't, don't marry her. Don't marry her. No, no, no. Man, with a voice like that, I got to marry her. So on the wedding night, they get back to the house. She took her wig off. She took one of her eyes out. He took a leg off. He looked at her and said, baby, sing. Baby, please. Baby, please. Sing, baby, sing. Sing, baby, sing. The real marriage. Honeymoon's over. The real marriage. And so it is in our walk with the Lord. We receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And man, sometimes for weeks, sometimes for months, it's glorious. It's glorious. But then all of a sudden, those real life issues start kicking up. And that's where we, the body of Christ, the Bible says, in Go encourage others with the same encouragement that you yourself has received. And so God is the one who gives the life. God is the author. God is the sustainer of life. But he calls us, his sons, his daughters, his disciples to go and to set those people free. People have to be taught to walk in the victory that Christ has made on the cross. Amen? Now, check this out. Write this down, please. Jesus said this. And Jesus said this right before he went back to glory. In Matthew chapter 28, in verses 18 to 20, which is known as the Great Commission, Jesus says, all authority. How much authority? How much authority? One more time. How much authority? Jesus says, all authority. Authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of a few nations. Some nations. No, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what the Lord has done is this. The Lord has placed on 
us. The Lord is again, he is the giver of life. He is the sustainer of life. But he's given us, his sons, his daughters, his disciples, his people, the awesome privilege, the awesome responsibility of going to those people, walking with those people that he has given the new life to. He's given us the awesome privilege of walking with them, setting them free. And so what the Lord says is this. Listen up. The Lord says, I have hundreds of people. I literally have thousands of people right here in this area that I want to give new life to. And therefore, I am sending you. Are you listening? The Lord says again, and again, remember the Great Commission. We have a job. All of us have a job. This is not just for Pastor Daryl. This is not just for Pastor Sean. This is not just for the elders. This is not just for the deacons. This is for all of us. I send you. The Lord says, I have hundreds. I have thousands of people right here in this area that I want to save says the Lord, and therefore I send you. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Romans. In the Romans chapter 10, in verses 14 and 15, the Lord says, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them. And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them who bring the good news. See, us bringing the good news, us setting people free is actually loving our neighbors. What could be more loving? What could be more kind than to go and set somebody free from the bondage of sin and death? The Bible tells us this. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but yet lose his soul? Man, we think that, man, oh, man, if I, if I could win the lottery or if I could win this sweepstake and if I can give my kids this and I can give my kids this, if I can give my kids 100000 if I can give my kids a million, if I can give my kids $10 million, Oh, man, that would be great. And it is great. But if they die and go to hell, what does it mean? The most loving, kindest, gracious, most generous thing we could give anybody is to usher them into the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us this, and we're about done. In the book of Jude, in Jude verses 22 and 23. It says, be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. So others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And so all of what we talked about today coincides with the exciting news the thing I want to share with you today, the exciting news is this, is that God has given us a greater opportunity to do everything that I talked about today. God has given us a greater opportunity to increase our kingdom building efforts by moving from this location to a new location. God has opened some fantastic doors for us that is just phenomenal. And when I tell you the Lord opened these doors, the Lord opened these doors. <laughs>